now I'll ask our panel uh, to the stage. There will be some more uh, things to watch, but I think it's great if you can see what wonderful expertise we have. Let's start with Siegfried Zielinski. Uh, or maybe you all come up and then it's easier. You, you can all see you, please. Take any seat you like. <laughs> And I'll make the introduction short because you all have the long bios or the, in, in your uh, conference materials. Um, Kai Fogus was dreaming of an academy uh, combining uh, the digital arts with uh, uh, theater. Some sort of academy is already in this uh, house because it's not only the ZKM, but a very important part of it is the Hochschule für Gestaltung, the University for Design, that is headed by Siegfried Zielinski. And I'm very happy that uh, Siegfried Zielinski is among us today and will give us an impulse. And you will later in this uh, afternoon uh, see um, I think around 10 to 15 of his students from the class of scenography that will present you their works on the topic of doppelganger. And we are very happy that yesterday you were a host for our preparation meetings and we had a very creative time in these rooms. So uh, we, we took the time for creativity. Uh, thank you, Marcos. And you will later see uh, what, what happens, what will happen. Uh, next to Siegfried is uh, Simon Meller. Simon is um, one of our advisory board members and from the Arts Council of England. And he will speak last to us in the opening uh, statements uh, about uh, the 69 projects uh, he created and about uh, the... Uh, um, yeah, you will, you'll, you'll hear it. Anyways, we, we are very happy. Simon has always very good advice for us that we have him with us this weekend. Mark Nonday is a new friend. It was Peter Weibel uh, who said, you must, if you have this conference, you must in integrate the Guy Tellurik. And since we are the city closest to France uh, in Germany, uh, and it's only two and a half hours by TGV to Paris, um, I uh, gladly made the trip. And uh, in one uh, wonderful Sunday afternoon, I discovered many of the activities of the Guy Tellurique in the Marais. Please all do the trip. It's a bustling center and we'll hear from Marc Donday what plans he has for the future of this 150 year old, uh, old operetta theater that's now transformed into a art institute of the future. And we have Dieter Schneider here also on our advisory board and uh, Dieter is, um, works for Arte. Uh, it's, uh, as you all know, the uh, uh, probably the best cultural channel we have, and it's uh, cross-the-border collaboration. And we are very curious to hear from uh, uh, Dieter, especially what the future of television, integrated television and theater and uh, television will be. So, but now I give the floor to Siegfried Zielinski, and uh, we heard uh, archaeology uh, will be digital in the future, but uh, as an archaeologist, you can, the future has already started uh, 30 years ago, I think. Thank you very much. I will try to take only a few minutes. Uh, I'm in a, a strange situation because I prepared for a longer lecture. Um, I'm, there was a misunderstanding. Uh, I wanted to go uh, through two and a half thousand years of relation between theater and technology. Um, because uh, as an archaeologist, uh, I don't accept uh, the 19th century as something like a final line or something where you can't go through anymore. Uh, we dealt here a lot also uh, in this house, for example, uh, with the period of time between 800 and 1200 regarding uh, Islamic uh, Arabic technologies and you will wonder uh, how much technology there was already on the stage including music automatons uh, and all kinds of things uh, which we think uh, are an invention of the 20th century and we go back if we go back to the uh, old Greek time uh, especially Alexandria uh, we will find the wonderful uh, automata theater uh, of guys like uh, Heron of Alexandria. Uh, this is 2,000 years ago. Uh, we don't have the time to do uh, all that. Uh, I just try to be uh, very, very short. And I try, I hope uh, this is not misunderstood, um, to uh, save at least one thought uh, which I had for my presentation. Uh, I used uh, a very dusty text uh, 
Brechts Organon uh, for the theater from 1948 to make up uh, the question or to uh, open the question what we are discussing when we are uh, talking about the interrelations of uh, theater, uh, arts, science, and technology. I just quote four lines. You know the text, of course, much better than myself. We need a theater that not only enables feelings, insights, and impulses which are allowed by the current historical field of human relationships on which the activities take place, and now the important point, but we need a theater that uses and generates ideas and emotions which play a role in the change of the field itself. This is the decisive point. If we talk about technology, um, and if we talk about the interrelations of technology and theater, we should forget about using technology like I make it very provocative, like Fura del Baus, for example, which is basically a decorative, very baroque use of technology. It has nothing to do with what Brecht addressed here in his quote. This has more to do of using advanced technology to make things nicer, to make them more effective, to make them faster, to create something like uh, Las Vegas uh, on the stage uh, with a lot of special effects. This, by the way, is completely fake. Uh, this from uh, the middle 90s, uh, Fora del Baus did not create any interaction between the screen and the stage. Uh, both uh, realities were completely parallel and did not have anything to do with each other. Um, Peter Weigel has addressed it. Uh, what interests uh, myself, what interests me uh, in going with students through these deep time interrelations, do, can we have sound, um, is very strongly um, the change that figures, human figures, on the stage, in the performance, become machines, apparatuses themselves. This is something which Brecht has addressed already uh, in his famous Lehrstück, The Flight Over the Ocean. Here is the apparat. Can we have just a little bit of the sound? Because uh, you might remember this is the recording from 1929, still recorded on... We are the apparatus. We are the apparatus. This is the point. This is uh, a first idea of creating something which you can call interobjectivity. The idea of intersubjectivity. Interobjectivity means the human being as a mixture already of grammar, of programmed entity. Uh, and technology is communicating with other things. This is a big circle which goes in philosophy back to the pre-Socratic thinkers, but we have no time uh, to deepen that. Um, just uh, one or two examples uh, how we started to work on this subject um, many years ago. Um, beginning of the 90s, we did projects with Flamand, uh, in Belgium and Plessy from uh, Italy. Uh, when you enter uh, the stage uh, and try to create uh, a digital sphere, um, the stage as a digital sphere, you have to simulate first the complete space of the theater. This is what we did. Uh, you have a calculated space, a calculated room, uh, and with this calculated room, you can then start, of course, to play and to fill them with different actions. Every uh, piece which we did in cooperation with theaters started with simulating the space, the room, and then uh, filling it uh, with the demands we needed for the theater. Uh, please uh, have in mind, this is uh, more than 20 years ago. This is from 1993, uh, 20, 94, we had the premiere. Uh, this uh, dance uh, with uh, the monitors um, is very, very close, of course, to behaviors we have nowadays uh, with uh, the iPhones and all the mobile 
um, uh, facilities, uh, this was an anticipation uh, which I had uh, many, many years uh, ago. Uh, a very important point, and I think I should stop here already because uh, I really don't want to take uh, all the time of the wonderful colleagues. A very important point is that we uh, have tried very early uh, to develop uh, works with the students uh, where they, like independent filmmakers, uh, can create the whole needs, the facilities, the technical needs, the decor, everything out of the machine, um, out of autonomous laboratories. Uh, this is an opera, a new interpretation of uh, Gluck's uh, famous uh, Orpheus uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, the students, Glad Khutov, uh, Timinko and Illich, who was, by the way, a granddaughter of Tesla, um, they uh, Compose the music completely new, electronically, and the whole decor, everybody you can see here on the stage is simulated. There is no uh, figure anymore. Uh, perhaps I should go into the next, uh, this is a bit enla enlarged, sorry. You can see it a little bit better. And if we can turn the sound up a little bit. So every, the, the project was called Opera from a Suitcase. The idea was everything you need to put an opera onto the stage uh, and into a space you can take with you in a small suitcase and you don't need billions or millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands, uh, but you just need very, very good ideas and a lot of creativity, a lot of artistic um, uh, talent uh, and then you can uh, quite easily uh, put these things into stage and I should uh, I would like to end uh, with uh, this project uh, interobjectivity this is a very early project on cyber sex and explorations about um, how uh, the future uh, erotic communication uh, will work uh, this led to uh, projects like that uh, where we uh, calculated uh, uh, actors, uh, dancers uh, on the stage uh, and brought them as calculated figures into correspondences with machines. The moving target, this is perhaps what Peter Weibel also meant when uh, he talked about uh, the robots on stage and we uh, watching the robots or the other way around. Uh, this was a, a piece on uh, borderline, uh, so this is a nice connection to what we just had seen from the colleague from Dortmund. I stop here, uh, no time. Uh, next time uh, we... Yeah, this is, this is about new technologies. They don't, uh, worldwide, WWW means worldwide waiting. Um, and uh, the most important effect is uh, the effect in time economy. Uh, we don't have time anymore. The time has us. Um, and we are just the stuff um, time uses uh, to perform itself. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm Marc Dondé, I'm the director of the Gaieté Lyrique Theatre in Paris. Uh, I first want to thank Peter Weibel and Jan Linders for inviting me, and I'll tell you why just now. Uh, the Gaieté Lyrique was built in 1862. It's in the very center of Paris, and it's a proscenium march theatre, the first director of which was Jacques Offenbach. And it was for a hundred years and more the temple of operetta, as Jan told you a bit earlier. Um, it was built exactly at the same time as the uh, Théâtre du Châtelet and the Théâtre de la Ville, which you know if you've been to Paris on the Place du Châtelet, in a very prominent, visible place in the very center of the uh, historic part of Paris. And the Gaîté Lyrique is just 10 minutes walk from the Châtelet, and that thing here, I must point out, is interesting because it is the moment when Haussmann changed the layout of the city. And in order to do that, he had to cut through the city with these huge avenues, Boulevard de Sébastopol. I'll take you around Paris when you come. And another one, which is uh, Boulevard Bonne Nouvelle. And that used to be called the crime boulevard, because that's where we had all these popular theaters 
that were producing pantomime and drama and the equivalent of what television series are today. Well, all that disappeared. And the Gaîté Lyrique was built halfway between the Châtelet and those, the Boulevard du Crime, as a tribute and a compromise in respect of that tradition of popular theater. So that's a good beginning to start with because it was ripped away from its roots in the city and with its audiences and dropped somewhere else. Yet, a beautiful theater, Jacques Offenbach, I mentioned, but the Gaîté Lyrique, 150 and 105, sorry, 1,500 seats, a very big stage, was the home of Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe. It was also the home of Isadora Duncan and 450 years of very brilliant productions. And then slowly, due to a certain lack of money, it sort of fell into disrepair and then fell asleep and then fell into a coma for 25 years. And then, as the story goes, uh, the mayor of Paris, 10 years ago, decided to transform it. Uh, by that time, the wonderful stage and house had been destroyed entirely um, and decided that it should be rebuilt as an arts center to deal with digital art and electronic music. And now, instead of the big stage and the 1,500-seat area, we have an exhibition space, we have a black box theater, we have an experimental space, which allows us to do 360 degrees experiments with sound and images. Uh, we have a resource center, we have workshops and um, residencies, um, spaces for artists. So it's a completely new story, and it's a completely schizophrenic story. So that's where we stand on, one leg in the past, one leg in the future, and we're somewhere in the present. And so I want to address the first question, which is a question of, of provocation. What does it mean today to run with that legacy, a place which is dedicated to the future? And what does it mean to confront artistic creation and digital technologies? And I really stand on the side of what uh, you said earlier this morning uh, about technologies and about the word digital. On the frontispiece of the building, we have drama, comedy. We don't have digital, right? Um, but then digital is somewhere there between drama and comedy. And as we address the present and the future with the perspective of, of speaking to a very large audience, not just to media artists, but with media artists to a very large audience. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have to be provocative. We have to address contemporary issues. And this is what we did with the first productions and events this year, from January and February onwards. The first event was called Whistleblowers, and it was dedicated to that question of the freedom of information. Are we in a society with the digital means of freedom or control, of transparency or surveillance? And what are those figures such as Julian Assange or Chelsea Manning who deal with that? We programmed this um, six months ago presented it two months ago, and on the second day of the event, uh, President Barack Obama issued his decision whereby he cut down the prison time of Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning is the soldier who revealed the uh, mishaps of the American army uh, shooting down uh, cameramen in Baghdad. So she went straight to prison, or he went straight to prison, in fact, for 35 years. And by that time also went through an extraordinary personal trauma by which she decided to change her gender, or his, or her, whatever. Now it's Chelsea. On the second day of the event, 
we were very, very happy to learn that she was going to leave her jail by next July instead of staying another 35 years in, in, in prison. So that means addressing an issue which concerns everyone, not just the whistleblowers. We don't want to divinize Julian Assange or anybody else, but through the eyes of artists, we have to address the question of access to information and access to the, to the means of creating art. And the second event we presented, which is still on now, and please do come until the 22nd of May, is an exhibition devoted to airports, and we transformed a huge part of the theater into an airport. Why? Because we want to address airports as spaces of hope, of elation, of evasion, of pleasure, but also as metaphors of our societies which have become, since September 11, spaces where your identity, and I'm very well aware of what you are presenting here on the question of identity and doppelganger, <clears throat> the question of identity is being scanned, scrutinized, um, capitalized, uh, and where bodies in space are the object of control as well. So dream, elation, perhaps being in a sort of a feeling of jet lag, this is what we try to create, so that perhaps, as you mentioned Brecht, we experience the circumstances differently as we live through the experience of art. So those are two examples. I just want to say two things perhaps we could do together, because we mentioned earlier this morning, well, of course, this is a, a network of possibilities. One thing is about immersion and 360 degrees performances. As I mentioned, we have these two spaces which have, and this is quite exceptional in Paris, the possibility of creating sound surround and image surround. The black box is a bit like this one, a bit bigger, but same thing. But we have screens all around, so we can uh, create images and also, of course, sound all around. The experimental space is a bit smaller, but is technologically much better. We are not as good as the IRCAM sound studios as regards sound, but we are better as regards image. And we need to enhance the technological potential of these spaces, so we are creating this program, which is called Immersion, and we are looking for artists, and we are launching a call for projects for artists to create work in three dimensions, and that is also the story of theater, which you referred to. Theater has always been, for a very long time, the test ground, the playground for tests of new technologies. So this is what we want to do. I mentioned earlier um, the link between past and present. When the city of Paris decided to revive the theater, what it said is we want to have in Paris the equivalent of two great places around the world. One is in Karlsruhe, and it's called the ZKM. Well, thanks, because you're an inspiration. And two is the Société des Arts Technologiques in Montreal, and they have a research program, and they also work on 360 degrees. And so I went to Montreal, and I asked Monique, please join us, and she is now a founding associate of our uh, company. So that's the sort of hope that I have for the future. And about immersion, we also have <coughs> uh, a program which I called Immersive Opera. And so I'd be very happy to pick up the thread from what you showed a bit earlier this, this morning, because this is what we, we want to do. And it's very, very basic, which is how do we have bodies, singers, on stage with a narrative, with music, in a technological environment. And that can be a physical environment or a virtual environment, taking us to VR and AR and soon immersive web. So that's a wonderful field of experimentation. We are launching this program and I'm happy to discuss it with you and maybe we can do this together. The other thing, and I'll conclude with this, I'm sorry, is connecting spaces. With Montreal, we are working and the SAT is developing a piece of software 
which allows the connection of theater spaces or of performances, performance spaces, whichever they are, between themselves. And they are developing this with a network at the moment of 28 public libraries, which means you can have the same scenography in the different spaces and then one performer or one speaker in one space, the audience sitting here, the audience sitting there, and both watching the same uh, performer. And this has been experimented also with theater schools between Montreal and Geneva, between Montreal and Paris, and we are developing this with the idea that, of course, we won't do everything with this, and certainly we don't want to say that this will replace face-to-face -face theater, but it's a combination of face-to-face -face and space-to-space -space in uh, the virtual uh, world. So there we are. Thank you very much. I won't say more for the time being. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Meller. Uh, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of the uh, Arts Council in England. Um, I'm going to approach this from a very different perspective. So what does this landscape look like for an organization like the Arts Council, which is about developing public policy? Um, uh, just a quick word about the Arts Council. We are uh, the investment, development, and advocacy agency for the arts in England. Um, we also look after investment in regional museums, uh, development work around public libraries, and also manage a, a music education program on behalf of the government. Uh, but it's important to say that we're for England. Uh, they have different arrangements in Scotland and Wales and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, we invest about 750 million uh, euros a year. Um, so why do we care about this stuff? Why, why is it of interest to, uh, to us what's happening in, in, in this world with, with, the, with the arts organizations that we, we invest in? Uh, and there are three main reasons that we, we care about it. The first reason is that we think these are opportunities to reach new audiences, to use this technology. Well, I, we think, we believe you can reach new audiences. That's important for us because we're constantly making the case to government for public funding, for public investment. It's a very, very competitive environment getting public funding for the arts, uh, in, for any type of public services in, in, in the UK at the moment. Our ability to demonstrate that the sector that we invest in, the organizations, the theaters, the music, the, uh, the uh, orchestras, etc., are committed to reaching new audiences and using digital technologies to do that is, is important. Uh, the second reason is, it again goes back to, to that issue of, of public funding. We are working in an environment where we're seeing less and less money, public money being invested in arts and culture in, in England. Uh, our funding has held up pretty well, but when you look at what's happening in, in relation to local government, it's a very, very serious situation. We therefore have to be concerned about how do we make those organizations that we invest in resilient, able to operate effectively in the modern economy. Understanding, we, for many organizations, arts organizations in England, they've labored under the illusion that other arts organizations are somehow their competitors for audiences. There is absolutely no evidence of this. Uh, the competitors for audiences come from the commercial entertainment industry. That commercial ent entertainment industry understands a lot more about its audiences, invests a lot more money in understanding who its audiences are, what they think about the work, than most of the arts organizations that we invest in. So we have to develop a data culture in, in our sector if it's going to be resilient going forward. And the third, and of course the most important reason, is that, as we've all been saying today, we're in the business of storytelling. How do we tell those stories in the, in the future? How do we use the technology? How do we equip the artists the, to tell stories in, diff in different ways? That, that's critical. So uh, what, what can we, as the Arts Council, do uh, in, in that world, in that landscape, to try to help arts and cultural organizations uh, engage and develop their skills and build capacity in, 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 the, in this digital world. Um, there are, I want to talk about three different things. The, the first two are around what we might call enabling. We, we know from our research that, that most commercial entertainment companies spend between 3 and 5% of their turnover on research and development. Our, our, our sector spends nothing like that in England, and we have to, we have to do something about developing a research and development culture. Uh, and, th and that's important because we need to learn about failure and what we can learn from failure. I always keep Beckett's words, or to paraphrase Beckett, Beckett fail, fail again better. We need to establish that culture. So we ran this program in collaboration with two other agencies, 
the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, uh, which is uh, a public policy organization looking at those overlaps between science and uh, uh, technology and the arts, and the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is the funding agency for research in, in higher education. And we ran a program designed to uh, incentivize arts and cultural organizations to collaborate with, with, with tech companies and researchers on formal uh, evaluated research and development in this area that looked at two things, d new ways of reaching audiences and new, uh, new uh, business models that you, could, that you might be able to develop through using new technologies. Um, and the critical thing for us is we wanted to capture the learning and to share the learning. So what you see here is the landing page on the on National Archives. We'll, we'll circulate the link later. Um, uh, of 70-odd of projects that we invested through that and, and the kind of learning from them. That's all captured in there. I think it's a valuable tool. Uh, we, we, we too often, uh, in our sector, the organizations do this, when they do research and development, they don't share it. There's no kind of learning is being shared. So that, that's what this is uh, attempted to do. The second thing about enabling in, uh, that environment, what else could we do? Um, and it was very interesting to hear about the, wor the work of, of Arte. One of the things we, we picked up very, very quickly is that, of course, uh, you will all know this. Uh, in the world of the internet, you have to go where the audiences are. You can't expect them to come to you. We, we know that the traffic into people, if people publish things on their own website and things like that, the traffic is, is, is generally very small because of course, we don't have the resources to, to market and to promote those. So um, we have been working collaboratively with the BBC over, over a, a number of years. Um, and you, I imagine most of you will know who the, the, the BBC is. And interesting thing about the BBC is through its uh, broadcast radio and online platforms, it still reaches over 90% of the population of the UK. And it is a major, major investor in arts and culture in, in, in the UK. It runs its own orchestras. It commissions content all the time. And we were very interested in how we could, in effect, try and make that organization more permeable. How do we open it up to the types of organizations that, that, that we work with? We've been running a number of projects. I'm very pleased to say this week, just two days ago, we announced the launch of Culture UK. Culture UK is a collaboration between the Arts Council and the other funding agencies uh, across the UK, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the BBC. At its heart are three uh, commitments. And uh, the first is that we will work collaboratively to identify what we call major landmark moments where we could work together. And that might be, uh, you know, the, 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 we have a major program around the end of the First World War uh, using commissioning contemporary art to, to look at that. that. That would be a collaboration we would use. How can we use the BBC's reach to amplify the work we're doing? So that, that's one element of the program. The second element of the program is that the, the, uh, the BBC has now committed to commissioning more content from uh, the, the art, arts organizations that, that we, we have been investing in. So our vision here is that we are gonna to move to a future where our, our organizations that we invest in will be multi-platform. They'll be, as they th think of those stories they want to tell, they will work out which, uh, which platforms that I think are, are, best, are best suited for that. Critically, they will become a new generation of indie, indie producers in the UK. They will now be creating content directly for BBC platforms. We're really pleased about that. I think that's going to make a, a big, big change, uh, to, both in developing skills and capacity and capability, but also in ensuring more of the content that uh, we invest in, it gets to, 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 to bigger audiences. Um, and the third thing is, is the BBC is going to make available its, its new technology. That it's, it, it, it has a very interesting uh, te technology uh, arm. I don't know whether those of you who spent time in the... In, in the, the in the UK, may have may have seen BBC iPlayer, which has been which has been a quite an interesting uh, a tool. So, for instance, the the BBC uh, developed a very interesting uh, platform for covering the Olympics in London in 2012, where they developed 20 kind of simultaneous streams that could work through their platform. So you could choose which event you're going to you want to you want to watch at any time. Is the gymnastics? Is it the swimming, etc.? You could you could you could watch that. It was a very very clever. Uh, highly functional. 
They are now going to make that available. So, for instance, this year's Manchester International Festival will use those different platforms to, to stream and engage with audiences o o online. So uh, that, the, the, those things are uh, the, the kind of very exciting developments that have just, just happened this week. So if you like, those are a couple of the sorts of enabling things. Of course, we do a lot of stuff around them, commissioning research, et cetera. One of the things that we've been doing as a result of this program is that we run a, a regular digital culture survey. We're tracking four or 500 organizations to see what's happening about their digital capacity, what the skills they're developing, what are the challenges they're facing. We can use that data and information to inform our work going forward. But I think we're now at the stage where we're going to move from, if you like, to the, from the enabling phase to something a bit more coercive. Um, and from the 1st of April 2018, we will require all our funded organizations to have in place digital policies. You will not be able to get permanent, you'll not be able to get regular funding from the Arts Council unless you have in place a digital policy. And that digital policy will have to look at how you use technology across, an, across all aspects of your organization. So for instance, we're very interested in what we call the three C's, uh, Marcus referred to it, some of that earlier, capture. How are you, how are you, what, what, what are you doing about capturing content and, and distributing that content? What are you doing about creating new content? And the third C, what are you doing about creating digital context? Uh, I, how, how might you create learning materials uh, for schools, for uh, your audiences generally, to, to help inform and enrich their, their, their experience. So that, that'll be one area we're looking at. We'll be expecting organizations to be able to, to, to talk about. Uh, the second area is, of course, around uh, audience data capture. How are, they, how are they capturing that data? How are they sharing it with other publicly funded organizations? How are they interrogating, mining that data to understand more about, about their audiences? What are they doing about selling online, et cetera? It'll, all these sorts of things, we'll, we'll, we're going to be looking now to, to, to the organizations we invest in to be much more explicit and much more developed in, in that area. And I think that's a sort of quite an important shift for us now, is that, is that we, we feel that this is no longer, in effect, a kind of something up for negotiation. It, unless unless the, the arts and cultural organizations in in our country, in England, start engaging with this seriously, we, we, we have concerns about their ability to, to sustain themselves in an environment where we're seeing shrinking public funding, where we're seeing audiences drifting uh, away from some of the, if you might, what you might call mainstream arts and cultural provision. And we, we, we do need to see our organizations being more pro proactive. And I think I would put out a question to you in this room, to all of you. How many of you have digital policies? If not, why not? What is, what's holding you back? You've got to start thinking in this way. Otherwise, in, in my experience in, in the UK, and I suspect it's not that different, uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be very, very hard. Um, you, you know, I, you, many of you, I'm, I look in envy to this country about what's happened and how public funding is held up. But, but it is a challenge, uh, and I think we've got to recognize that the so types of organizations uh, certainly in England, that we, we uh, traditionally invest in, have got, to, have got to change, have got to be more adaptive, have got to engage with the, with the realities of how most people lead their cultural lives today. Thank you.